This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 96, recorded on September 30th, 2015. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me is Dixon de Pommier. Hello Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello everybody. It's the last day of September. It is. And it's stormy outside. Ooh. It's been cloudy the last few days here. It has. We finally, finally got rain. 22 Celsius currently. Very and cloudy. Dropping. And dropping. Very cloudy dropping. And Ooh, dropping. It's going to almost 10 tonight. Wow. This is true. Last night it was very humid. It was, including today also. I like it. And 83% humidity. As if you didn't like the weather today, wait till next Monday we're getting a hurricane. <laughs> Daniel, you don't care about the weather, right? I actually do. I always care about the weather, the wind particularly. <laughs> right, he's a sailor, remember that? Yeah. 83% so, and, and, and humidity. I think we're going to have good sailing this weekend. Oh, you'll have remarkable Particularly sailing. <laughs> Saturday and Sunday, which I think Saturday I'm going to get Barnaby, my 10-year-old, out on the laser for some, hopefully some lessons. And then Sunday he's going to be racing his little Opti on the south shore of Long <laughs> Island. Cute. How cute. Opti, yeah, I used to have two Optis. And uh, my kids learned on a laser and then a 420. Mm-hmm. It's a two-person one. Those are big boats, the 420s. Two people. My two sons would do that. They even had hikers on them. Mm-hmm. And now, uh, well, the boat's away for the winter, unfortunately. So we can't do any sailing. It's too bad. It's too bad. Okay, so well. we should not lament over sailing or the weather. <laughs> no. <laughs> However, we do have a twip. We have first... And I have to resist making this whole podcast in a silly accent, so please remind me. And because of, because why, Vincent? Tell us where you're going, at least. I'm going to Germany in a couple of days. To do what? I'm going to give some lectures. Excellent. On microbiology, which are going to be recorded. Nice. For uh, posthumous, no, posterity. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to Leipzig. Is that how you say it? Leipzig. Leipzig? Leipzig. Yeah. So it's a long time. It's five days. I usually don't go away that long. Well, yeah. Okay, we have a follow-up first from Ella, who writes, Long-time listener, first-time email. Mm-hmm. I am surprised that no one got the diarrhea case, although I would have been wrong as well. So many familiar parasites. <laughs> I was diagnosed with blastocystis hominis in 1990 when I came back from a year in Nepal. The symptoms were more like Giardia than anything else, but were not self-limited. I did the series of three stool tests and got told by college health services that this was a, quote, new, unquote, pathogen being found in HIV patients. I was given the number to CDC by the lab and told to call. I did. They recommended seven days of metronidazole, which the college doctor gave me, and my symptoms went away and have never returned. Well, uh, Dixon said there is no treatment. Was I just lucky? <laughs> well, Dixon doesn't know everything, but in this case, uh, lots of other people with blastocystis have taken more than just seven days worth of metronidazole, and they didn't go away. So maybe, you know, metronidazole is a generic drug which treats anaerobes. It doesn't treat blastocystis or ehistolytica or mm. giardia. It treats anaerobes. So any anaerobe that gets knocked out that might have been giving you a problem would result in a quotes unquote cure. I will, uh, I will jump in. I will, jump in. I will, I will jump. say as a, as a clinician and a scientist, uh, every year that goes by, I become more humble and uh, <laughs> really, that's that's odd. <laughs> and, uh, no, no. I mean, year, I mean years, years ago, maybe with a uh, 
I th- if you're paying attention, you should be humble. Oh, that's different. That would be my. <laughs> if your clinicians are not humble, they're not paying attention. Oh, this is true. But no, years ago, I would have said like, no, we we say this isn't a pathogen, but it's gone from not a pathogen to, mm-hmm. and you know, I'll quote the CDC: the clinical significance is currently controversial, and right. they actually do. The CDC offers several suggested treatment regimens. One of them yep. is with metronidazole. Yep. There's two ways of doing that. Yep. Another is Bactrim, your trimethoprim sulfa drugs. Right. Another is nidazoxanide. I think we've brought brought that yep. up before. Yep. It, it's not clear, and, and I've um, there was a clinician from Australia that I was recently interacting with, and they had several cases in a family, and it seemed that symptoms were correlating with the identification of this organism, and, and yeah. I sort of poo pooed it. There's a little bit of no, a pun no, there. I, I guess. was going to say no pun. Intended, and, but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we saw this similar pattern that upon treatment and eradication from the stool, that the symptoms got better. So um, I'll, I'll be humble here and say, you know what? Um, I don't know if in your situation this was an actual pathogen or if the treatment treated something else. And this was no. sort of an indicator um, of that. But uh, I think it's fantastic that you got better. Oh, absolutely. Continuing with yeah. Ella. Indeed. I later had entamoeba histolytica during my Peace Corps service in the Central African Republic. I'd forgotten the bit about it being non-invasive. Good stuff. (laughs) I also had giardiasis during my first trip to Nepal. Now I never catch anything when I travel. Totally immune. (laughs) I went to Dartmouth Medical School before the Seuss conversion and was taught microbiology by the incomparable Elmer Pfefferkorn. He's the best. The kindest man alive. No question. Do you know him? I know him so well that we uh, co-hosted a, um, oh, we co-hosted meetings up in um, New England in the summertime called Gordon Conferences, and I was the co-chair for one year, and then uh, he was the chair, and then the next year when he dropped off the committee, I was the chair. So, I, yeah, we knew each so other very So she sent well. uh, his... He's great. Uh, she sent a copy of his CV, which you can find online, but I also found his website. He is, his title is Active Emeritus Professor of Microbiology. <laughs> Active Emeritus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. No, that would fit him. That yeah. definitely would fit him. He got his PhD at Harvard in 1960. Yeah. yeah, he's a remarkable individual. And it's written here, a favorite story, one which all of Elmer's students can recount, illuminates the concept of fecal veneer. <laughs> Thin layer of feces. <laughs> That's right. Listen to this. Elmer has always displayed an incredible respect for his students by being punctual and prepared for each lecture. Yes. Generally spending several hours rehearsing his material, even for lectures he had already delivered many times. His philosophy of teaching medical students is to be absolutely clear and absolutely fascinating. Right. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's just remarkable. I think he was that's on a wonderful. study section with me. He was the hit of the study section because he would always have an anecdote or a that. story to add to the the grant, and uh, he was very generous with his criticisms. That is to say, he erred on the side of generosity and giving the grantee the uh, or the potential grantee the, the benefit of the doubt in most cases. And he was a very generous man. He was extremely kind and and all fun that to you be wanted with. to be, right, Texas? Yes, and wa- <laughs> and, and I'm not. <laughs> All right, continuing. Uh, I was turned on to the Twix podcast by a friend who is a bench scientist and really love the intellectual stimulation and memories it brings up. Mm-hmm. I must say, overall, Dixon is my oh. favorite. <laughs> how could that be? <laughs> and I dread the day that Vincent tells us how he really feels. <laughs> I like all of the other co-hosts as well, but on TWIV, Dixon's <laughs> role of audience surrogate and his function of winding up Vincent makes him precious. <laughs> you wind me up? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> and, you know, unintended, but, you know. She, sh- she should see what you do off mic. No, she should not see. <laughs> and I don't want to disillusion this poor woman. Come on, she's got the right attitude. The weather in Kathmandu, 71F21C, 94% humidity, Likely to rain either tonight or tomorrow. Thanks right. for everything, Ella. Wow, Kathmandu. Where is yeah. that? The cat. In cat. What's cat the, You don't cat. pronounce the H. It's why, why not? When I was a kid, it didn't even have an H in it. No, that's true. No, you're absolutely <laughs> and right. When I was a kid, it was Calcutta. No, no, no. no. It was a different city. Different city. No, this is Kathmandu. Is no, no, no. Not this one. I'm just Nepal saying Nepal. things have changed. Oh, yeah. oh, no, since no, of I was course, a kid. India changed every name of their big cities. So that's why right. did they put the H in? 
That's a good question, actually. When I was a kid, it didn't have an H. Well, at least in America. You know, the other thing like that is Neanderthal rather than Neanderthal. That's what you think. (laughs) I don't know, but that's the way it is. Kathmandu. That's a dangerous place for many reasons, one of which is the um, seismic qualities of Kathmandu is pretty dangerous. That, uh, was, let's, un- that let's, was unfortunate, the, the <clears throat> recent earthquake, I guess, yeah. not so recent now. Yeah, hey, hey the Nepali pronunciation. Yes. Kathmandu. Really? Yeah. The T-H is pronounced. They put the T-H. So well, I'm just then, being Nepali, man. I think we That's should. Very good. Even though I'm not from Naples. When in... <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> when in Rome, we should do this, the Romans. All right. Uh, Dr. Griffin, would you remind us about the sure. case from Twip 95? I was just going to say, Ella, it's nice to get an email from Kathmandu. I spent about a month there at the Beer Hospital. So if you're familiar, it's a big hospital. How do you spell that? B-I-R, not with two E's. Yeah, I didn't think it was all about no, beer. No, it's not all about beer. B-I-R. And uh, that's, that is a wonderful place to be. But All right, enjoy yourself there. Case from Twip 95. Let's remind everyone. This was a case of a 28-year-old single female. And she had returned from a beach vacation with her new boyfriend. And uh, she'd spent two weeks in Central America in Belize. And uh, she was um, telling us how exciting it was that she found these secluded beaches away from the big tourist um, hotels and beaches. She had been in good health, but she noticed these small nodules, papules on the front of her thighs, thought they were insect bites, but they became very itchy. And then she noted these serpiginous red lines that were forming and radiating out from the bumps. Um, And I think I had mentioned that I saw something similar in uh, Lima. And uh, some people had asked some questions. Um, I think the jury had noted that there were dogs, wild dogs, seen on the beach. Jury had noted. Um, (laughs) She had uh, also told us that she had ceviche, which is raw, sort of pickled fish. We don't know if that's relevant. No. Um, And uh, she had lain on the beach um, and told the truth. And she'd been on top of a thin fabric when she was lying. Laying on the beach. (laughs) (laughs) I feel a poem. (laughs) All right. um, Okay. So do we want to continue our grilling of the grilling No, we got to read the the guest. Oh, all right. You forget the process? (laughs) No, 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 no. Lynn writes, dear TWIP team, I'm a molecular biologist who has spent the past two plus decades... Raising five wonderful children, a zoologist, a veterinarian, two engineers, and the youngest is a freshman. (laughs) My many and unanswered job applications have informed me that I'm no longer lab-worthy. So I fulfill my love for biology by taking Coursera courses, Dr. Racaniello's, of course, reading fascinating books, D. Crawford's Deadly Companions, for instance, and listening to Twiv, Twip, Twim, and Urban Agriculture. Mm Mm-hmm. My guess for the case study of Twip 95 is an an encyclostoma Brasiliense, type of hookworm which thrives in sandy soils of subtropical region and is an intestinal parasite of cats and dogs. It is the major cause of cutaneous larval migraines in humans. Humans are dead-end hosts. The hookworm larvae do not develop further. However, they cause intense itchiness, which I would imagine could lead to secondary bacterial infections in the affected area. Treatment is administration of oral thiabendazole, 500 milligrams for times i think the ceviche is a red herring uh-huh. many many thanks for such informative and entertaining podcasts dixon robin writes the question to ask is how the anterior thighs were in contact with contaminated sand perhaps lying prone with the cloth being short and only up to the region of the hips the anterior legs may have been spared by the angle of the ankles it's almost hard to I read. Forgot to, but uh, there's no diagnosis. Yeah, I forgot to put it in. Cutaneous larva migrants. Cutaneous larva migrants. Right. Caused by... Hang on. Let's see if Robin... Uh, I, sometimes I, I miss things because I uh, do this too okay. late. You know, cutaneous larva migrants. Right. That's what he wrote in this uh, email. So there are two species that are possible culprits. One is the Brazilianses, as they mentioned. But the yeah. other... Is Ancelostoma, pronounced Ancelostoma, caninum, which is also a dog. Ancelostoma. Ancelostoma. Not encyclostoma. Or ankylostoma. Because there's no second C in it, yes. Exactly, exactly. I got it, dude. <laughs> I'm there, I'm on By it. George, he's got it. I'm on it. 
<laughs> da- Daniel, can you take a couple? I will take a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> take Benedict a writes, Hi, I think the lady has cutaneous larva migraines from the wild dog's helmets. Joseph writes, Cutaneous larva migraines. Peter writes, Diagnosis, cutaneous larva migraines, possibly due to a catadum. Nicholas writes, Dear doctors of TWIP, this is a little longer here. Caninum, I, by the way. Caninum. I hate to correct your pronunciation. No, please, please K-9-um. do. Caninum is in Kenya. Yeah. I, was, I was having trouble, like earlier, I was reading a thing and it had drosophilia on there. <laughs> yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. That's I always true. have pronunciation yeah. problems. <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, I took a slight hiatus from your program only to return to what is an even more informative and entertaining program <laughs> through the addition of the clinical expertise provided by Dr. Daniel Griffin. I applaud you all and extend my deepest gratitude for your efforts in disseminating knowledge in your respective fields. I'm currently an anatomical veterinary pathology resident at Louisiana State University. It's a great school for that. Attending veterinary school in Kansas, many of the things I've diagnosed while in Louisiana, I either never learned about or resulted in a margin note of, this disease is only a problem of the South, don't worry (laughs) about it for the examination. Right. As the always hot and humid Southern Louisiana would have it, those diseases have now become my everyday reality, and a love for infectious disease has followed. Nice. In regards to the 28-year-old female beachgoer, as a veterinarian, a mental image of a puppy with the pale mucous membranes and a small intestinal lumen full of hookworms and hemorrhage comes to mind. I believe this is a case. Do you want to pronounce this, Dixon? Ancelostoma caninum. Hookworm. <laughs> a zoonotic <laughs> agent that claims canids <laughs> as a definitive host. Humans become infected through exposure to L3 larvae that develop from morulated eggs deposited in the feces of infected canids. The L3 larvae directly penetrate the skin and manifest clinically as erythematous and pruritic serpiginous tracts. Look at that. Which is a classic presentation for cutaneous larval migraines. Here, here. This woman was predisposed to developing this condition through her adventurous nature, which <laughs> led her to secluded beaches inhabited by feral canids. These animals are typically not tolerated at popular public beaches, and thus people are less likely to be exposed to the infective L3 larvae stage. I find it interesting that her companion somehow didn't also display evidence of cutaneous right. larval migrants but maybe he was more interested in surfing than sunbathing. Mm -hmm. I also anticipate there wasn't much beach romance going on, at least without the use of a towel or tent. With that in mind, sex on the beach is best served cold. I frequently see... It's a drink. It's a drink. It's an actual drink called sex on the beach. Really? Yeah. Vincent was looking confused. He was. Okay. Let's look it up. Look it up. Sex on the Beach is uh, actually, uh, it's, a, it's a drink. I'm surprised. Okay. I frequently it is a drink. see it is this a drink. species of hookworms in young puppies, which right. I presume is due to repeated transmammary exposure, though ingestion yeah, of milk yeah, yeah. and or lack of repeated deworming in puppies. In contrast, I rarely see this parasite in domesticated adult canids, hmm. which I attribute to the high compliance of monthly anti-helminthics which are routinely prescribed in veterinary medicine for various parasites, including heartworms, hooks, ascarids, and whipworms. For everyone's viewing pleasure, I've attached a gross image, I think that means large, from a case I had in a puppy that died from severe anemia. That may actually be gross. Um, Attributed to, and again, Dixon? And Salostoma caninum. In the future, I'd be happy to share gross or histological images from my cases. So please don't hesitate to <coughs> shoot me an email if you're presenting a zoonotic agent that is prevalent in the southern U.S. I'll be beginning a Ph.D. next fall at the nice. Tulane Primate Center and oh, will be great. commuting daily from NOLA, which means I'll finally have an opportunity to catch up on TWIP, TWIV, and the likes. Thanks again for all you do, Nick. And I'll, I'll say, Nick, um, yeah, if you've got some uh, good pictures, send them our way. Sure, I'd be curious bet. to see them. You bet. Sex on the Beach is made with vodka, cranberry juice, <laughs> peach, snop, schnapps, schnapps, and orange juice. Yep. Not my style. Best served cold. <laughs> <laughs> I would guess so. <laughs> Christine writes, Dear Vincent, Dixon, and Daniel, greetings from sunny Brisbane, where the temperature is a delightful 26 C and a light breeze gently rustling in the macadamia leaves <laughs> in my backyard. Although the past two twips have not appeared in my podcast feed, hence I missed the last one entirely, 
I finally got grumpy while listening to Twiv, which is showing up, when you say you had recorded four podcasts that week and found them on Microbe World. Uh-huh. This week's patient is showing the classical signs of cutaneous larval migraines. It is, as you know, an infection with hookworm larvae in the skin. A number of species are associated with, depending on location of infection. Ancelostoma brasiliense is most common in Central America. In South America, it infects dogs and cats. Humans are a dead-end host, and therefore the infection is self-limiting. Although the discomfort and unsightly appearance leads to treatment using anti-helminthics such as tiabendazole, albendazole, mebendazole, and ivermectin. Without going into the life cycle, etc., the patient most likely contracted the infection by lying on the sand under light sari material through which the larvae could pass when they hatched from eggs deposited in on the sand in the feces of the wild dog seen in the area. The boyfriend may have simply been luckier where he lay, or if he lay on a more substantial towel, it may have been sufficient barrier to the larva. The larvae may lie dormant for weeks or months or may migrate straight away. Therefore, we cannot be sure exactly when, where she was infected, but as she did not notice the bumps till she got back, it was probably towards the end of her trip. Yours in anticipation of more great stories and learning. Christine from Brisbane. All right. So so far, everybody's gotten it. Huh? They have. Well, we don't know. We don't know what the answer is. But. No, we don't. Of course not. But uh, yeah, so let's put it a different way. So far, everyone's in, in agreement. That's and right. last time, they were not. That's right. Dixon, you're next. Okay. Uh, Dave writes, Dear Twip Trio, In the case of the 28-year-old woman who visited Belize, I believe she has a case of hookworm infection, specifically cutaneous larva migrans, which is the correct way to write that, caused by Ancelostoma brasiliensis, or brasiliensi. Humans are are accidental hosts to these parasites, which typically parasitize dogs and cats. When contaminated feces come in contact with skin, the larvae of the hookworm burrow under the skin and begin to travel through the skin. The fact that there were wild dogs on the beach is a major red flag, and (laughs) along with the serpiginous rash locale and sensation of movement, this points to cutaneous larva migraines. Recommended treatments, albendazole, ivermectin, or thiabendazole. The weather in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts is a cool and cloudy 62 degrees Fahrenheit. P.S. I think we'll be happy to know that I recently purchased my membership to the American Society of Parasitologists. <clears throat> I plan on reading the journal as much as I can, and I hope this decision helps potential graduate professors show my passion for parasites, <clears throat> what I want to study for a Ph.D. What would show your passion even more would be to listen to TWIP. Exactly. <laughs> Which she does. It. Or he does. No, he does. That's a he. Daniel. Elise writes, Dear Twip Trifecta, how are you? I hope this finds you well. It is suddenly a bit cooler here in Lower Manhattan, (laughs) 72F22C. But the weather is very nice, so I'm not complaining. After failing to correctly diagnose Twip94, I am picking myself up again and attempting to sort out whatever is going on with the young woman who went to Belize. I believe the patient has cutaneous larva migrants. The infection infestation is usually caused by hookworm larvae. Ancyclostoma. <laughs> Caninum. <laughs> and ankylo, she uses a, an older world spelling for this, ankylostoma. So ancylostoma is the modern spelling of caninum and ancylostoma brasiliense. Are the dog and cat hookworms? <clears throat> Everything seems to point to hookworm. CLV is quite common in South America, and Dr. Griffin pointed out that he had another very similar case in Lima, Peru. In addition, the patient spent a lot of time on rather remote, non-touristy beaches in Belize that were frequented by wild dogs. Since the hookworm larvae is transmitted to new hosts through dog or cat feces, it is not at all unlikely that the dogs she saw were once or future hookworm hosts. She spent a lot of time lying on the sand, and while she used a thin sarong-type fabric as a blanket, the fabric's weave may have been loose enough for the larvae to get through, or she may have spent some time exposed directly to the sand. Many cases of CLM manifest themselves on people's feet, between toes, because walking barefoot on the beach is so common. I was thinking that the fact that she frequented more remote beaches was significant because more touristy spots, especially those close to resorts, tend to be cleaned up more regularly and are busier so that animal traffic may be somewhat more limited. In addition, the patient's symptoms are consistent with a CLM infection, 
When Dr. Griffin first described the patient's distress, I was confused because his very gentle discussion of a little <laughs> raised nodule with red serpiginous line coming from it didn't sound so dramatic. But when I found images of CLM infections online, I see that it would indeed be very upsetting. Indeed. Also, severe itching is another symptom of a hook or infestation, and that is awful indeed. While these infections are self-limiting, after what sounds like a miserable, itchy, and rashy series of weeks, they can be treated with topical medication, thiabendazole, or with oral medications, albendazole, ivermectin. Is there a reason for preferring the oral drugs to the topical or vice versa? After an off week last week, I do hope I did better this time. <laughs> As always, thank you so much for your wonderful work. Best wishes. Uh, my next? I forgot. You're yes. next. <clears throat> Andrew writes, Dear TWIP team, my conclusion is that the patient is suffering from cutaneous larva migraines, most likely due to ancillostoma brasiliense, the presence of dogs on the beach, and the use of thin fabric support the evidence. The hookworm eggs were likely passed through canine feces, which landed on the sand where they hatched. The larvae were then able to penetrate the patient's skin through the thin fabric. The symptoms of red itchy bumps and lines are consistent with CLM as the worms creep through the skin. Although human hookworms are able to cause intestinal problems, A. brasiliensis and animal hookworm lacks the enzymes needed to burrow deeper through human tissue. Mm -hmm. Normally, the worms travel to the lungs first and then end up in the intestines. Uh, finally, there is geographic evidence as A. brasiliensis is known to be found in Central America. Dixon. I like the next one because of the use of puns. It's very Andrew good. Andrew writes, Dear Twipanasome. It's very good. I love it. Except, <laughs> I mean, did, like, except you didn't say dear. Well, I did. I, and I thought he was an endearing person <laughs> to begin with. Hello, Twipanasome. Okay. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe is. that I, could be a title someday. The Hello, Twipanasome. Twip we have to just do a case that involves. We do. We did do. you ever have a Twip case? I mean, a Trypanosome case? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, now it's given away. We can't. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Should I'm I begin a again? Should I begin again? <laughs> oh, we're talking over one another. <laughs> Let's try this again. Andrew writes, Hello, Twipanosomes. I am an electronics engineer based in Christchurch, New Zealand. I've been there. It's an interesting place. Suffered a horrible earthquake several years ago. My diagnosis of the current case is scabies. Key symptoms being the itchiness and wavy lines. Many thanks for the many hours of fun and information. I'm a keen listener of Twip, Twiv, and Twim. Cheers. Daniel. Eric writes, Dear Twip Triumvirate, Thank you for another fun case of the week. All clues given seem to point to a clear case of leash maniasis. The described wild dogs were likely the reservoir hosts on these secluded beaches. Mm. An infected sandfly likely bit the woman while she lay on the beach. An infection ensued. Treatment will not be fun. It is sunny and 70 degrees here in Seattle, a beautiful fall day. Carol writes, greetings, Team Twip. After a busy summer during which I have been listening to the podcast but not finding time to write in, even when there has been a multi-week gap between episodes, I finally managed to send this before the next episode has aired. I suppose the structure of a full semester can be beneficial after all compared with the relative freedom of taking a single summer class. I'm going to resurrect a previously incorrect guess for this episode's case study. If it is again incorrect, I will continue to guess it every episode <laughs> until it is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Foul-smelling steatorrhea, I will make the same guess. Long worm removed from an ankle lesion by twisting it around a stick, I will make the same guess. <laughs> they will have to be right someday. The woman with serpiginous red lines creeping out of papules on her thighs has cutaneous larva migraines, uh -huh. presumably ancillostoma brasiliense. The wild dog's beach, pruritus, and many other things point to this being correct. If not, there's always the next case study. <laughs> Thank you always for an enjoyable series of podcasts. Carol from Victoria, where oh, it is currently nice. raining gently in 16C. Yep. Last one, Dixon. AJ writes, Hello, Twippers. I'm writing a guess for the case introduced in arsenic and leishmania. What fun contemplating all of the subcutaneous visitors you can acquire at the beach. This sounds to me most like a case of cutaneous larva migraines. I know a couple of species could be culpable, but considering most of what I know of this condition comes from one House MD episode, <laughs> I won't speculate a precise species. I hope this poor lady got those pesky zoonotic hookworms <laughs> removed without issue. Also, the TWIP website appears to be down at the moment. Oh, dear. 
I can still access Twiv and Twim, though. Keep it up. Is that the website <clears throat> access to keep up? Um, you'll, have to, <laughs> you'll have to ask uh, AJ. <laughs> Yeah, website's okay. There, there was a brief outage a few weeks ago. That uh, might correct. Be. <clears throat> Mine went down too, by the way. Which one? The uh, Urban Ag. Urban Ag yeah, went I think down? I told you about that. Yeah. And now it is uh, and good. you kindly fixed Vertical it. Farm disappeared. Yeah, that's right. It did, didn't it? It just I, went I, right off. Uh, Vertical Farm is back yeah, up. Yeah, we can't allow that. All right. So, uh, Daniel, uh, right. tell us what other things you did to cinch this diagnosis. You know, there's nothing else. That's it, huh? this, this is it. What, what I told you is, is all you needed to know. Did you need to know uh, anything else, Dixon? No, I actually no. didn't. No, I think no, I this, this is a clinical one. diagnosis. There's no, there's no yeah. blood test. There's nothing. Yeah. You see this, you recognize it. That's true. Um, we had a couple people not go with the crowd, and I'm going to discuss why. So the, what is the diagnosis? Tell us. Cutaneous larva migrants okay. and the treatment um so that there's <coughs> as some of our people mentioned some of our email people put in um one of the options and what we usually go with is an oral medication um we should probably talk a little bit about what this actually is and why we're going to treat it so this is a hookworm that ends up in the wrong host and what we'd like to do and there's actually a lot of these larvae there crawling around and they are intensely itchy we'd like to basically kill them so they don't continue to create this horrible pruritus, the horrible itchiness. And you can do that with a couple different medications, albendazole or ivermectin. Um, and this woman, I believe, was treated with albendazole. So orally um, is preferred. It's just easy. If you if you think about it, they've got all these, you know, all right. so larvae. If you did so, topical, it might be you might miss something and then yeah, and we, we usually okay. really don't even recommend it. I mean some people and I'm gonna recommend against this, some people will actually freeze these, right? They'll use the liquid mm. nitrogen. I just yeah, uh, I'm not sure about treatment. the scarring um, yep. effect. So I, yep. I've always shied away from that. Um, and then we also are going to, you know, this is the whole thing. Oh, there you're, you're all going to be better, but they're going to go home itchy. So we'll use a medication, too, to help right. with the itch. Right, right. So, um, you know, that could be any of our antihistamines, Vistaril, Atarax, things like that. Benadryl, actually, is probably fine as well. And topically, we might use like a cortisone, just something to help with the inflammation. Yeah. I'm not sure how much that really helps, but even just a lotion, because um, it is quite um, uncomfortable. It is. Um, I've seen some really bad pictures of them where uh, people... Um, Good pictures of a bad thing? Yeah. <laughs> These are great pictures of a horrible condition. Uh, one was of a woman who was, a, who was um, uh, visiting a topless beach and her whole upper torso on the downside near her breasts were completely inundated with these She was lying down in the sand. Yeah. She was really badly affected. So, so and, I know at the Jersey Shore they don't let dogs on the beach. Is this one right. of the reasons This is why? one of the reasons. Exactly mm -hmm. right. And in fact, in Puerto Rico, there's only one place that they are allowed on the beach, and that is the public beaches. <laughs> <laughs> all of the private beaches are not allowed on, on at all, but the public beaches are all over the place. Do dogs in the U.S. carry this infection? They, they do, yeah, they right? They can. They don't all, but they but can. But this fellow in, in uh, the South said he's seen dogs oh, with yeah, it, Oh, right? yeah, yeah. No, the South has got lots of hmm. it. They do. But, you know, a top, it used to be, I don't know if this is still the case, but thiabendazole actually used to be given as a topical application mm -hmm. with uh, DMSO to improve the uh, permeability into mm -hmm. the uh, subcutaneous tissues. Yeah, and, and actually it was we very had effective. Some, some people write in with that. And, uh, and not only that, uh, thiabendazole is uh, a, an anti-inflammatory agent when it's applied like that. So it covers two bases at the same time. Yeah, we had a couple people um, guess some other things. We had a leishmaniasis mm -hmm. guess. And uh, leishmaniasis is one of the things we always talk about is the painless nature. Yeah. Um, and this is intensely itchy. But so, another differentiation is, of course. The other would be the fact that we have multiple of these nodules right. and then the serpiginous lines. Now, the leash, yeah. if you think yeah. about leishmaniasis, right, they're these tiny little guys. They're not going to be migrating through the skins like our basically worms, our are helmets plus they form crateriform lesions not just uh, it goes on to something it doesn't just stay like that that is true they they these papules tend to ulcerate and what was the other somebody else scabies uh, scabies scabies <clears throat> scabies usually occurs between the webs of the feet and the webs of the hands and it's burrowing. You've, you've basically got a, an yeah, ectoparasite that's burrowing. This is something that got under the skin 
and now is wandering about trying to find yeah, that's well right. where it wants to be. But the itching from scabies is similar to that this. That is true. You'd end up with a lot of itchiness with scabies. So uh, uh, it wasn't a bad guess. It was just a wrong guess. No, and I actually like what the least man they brought up the dogs yeah, yeah, as a yeah, possible yeah. Sure, zoonotic. Sure, sure. Uh, we have so it in this you, country uh, because of that. Do you have leash, leishmaniasis in Belize? Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, there's, a, there's actually quite a bit of leishmaniasis through Central America and into South America. Okay. And as we mentioned, a few cases in the U.S., but not too many. Right. Uh, Which were brought over from Europe, from Central, from the uh, Mediterranean in hunting dogs. All right. But we should talk a little bit about how did this woman get this disease? <laughs> this okay. disease. So, and, uh, she so was we'll, laying down <laughs> on the beach, and that's, you know, unfortunate. The stochastic nature of life in general yes. <laughs> produced these two random events, or maybe three or four. But right next to her, that's not where the dog. I presumably, were. the density of larvae in the sand varies. It's not consistent oh, exactly everywhere, right? right? Exactly. It's right. Uh, you know, it's where Wherever where the they were deposited, and yep. and there is an interesting issue about why it's so much safer to be at a tourist beach, mm-hmm. and it's not as though the dog defecates and then you lay in it. You don't actually get these. I think I saw Dixon cringe. Maybe it was from this. You don't get it directly from the feces. Out come the eggs. The eggs take about Mm -hmm. a week Mm -hmm. on average, five to 10 days, we say, to go to the point where they're then larvae. Because the eggs have to hatch. The eggs don't infect you. It's the eggs embryonate, the larvae come out, then the larvae penetrate your skin. So if you're at a tourist beach, you, you may notice this if you know our listeners have been to tourist beaches, maybe they have. A lot of times they drive a tractor or they mm-hmm. rake the beach, yeah, yeah. and they're basically disturbing the soil and preventing these eggs from embryonating, going on to form the larvae, and then infecting us. The second thing they do is they put chairs out. Um, so a couple things happened here. Is, is one is our poor person. Um, and I say poor in terms of money, but unfortunate. Poor, unfortunate. poor is unfortunate. <laughs> That's right. Is she went to a place where a dog had a week before defecated. She chose that spot to lay down, and there were larvae in the area. Um, the interesting issue is, is this cloth that she lay down on the beach, is it thick enough to prevent them? Or as one of our people put in, you know, we, we think, Thin. well, I don't want my chest and face on the sand. So this covers her chest and face, but then her thighs are extending down below. Oh, and maybe point. maybe that is how she became in contact. Sure. Sure. So Dixon larva. just showed us a photo of the third stage larva. No, that's, the one. that's what's in the sand. That's right. Yes. And this penetrates the skin. It does. And then remains subcutaneously. That's correct. Because it doesn't receive the right environmental cues once it's in the skin. It realizes too late that it's not on a dog. So it, it spends all of its life trying to escape <laughs> back out again. How long are these larvae <laughs> rough? Oh, they're, they're microscopic, maybe right 60 to 70 microns in okay. length. Oh, by the way, that, that was not taken by me. That was a picture taken by Eric Grave, and it's a remarkably beautiful picture. So I, I just wanted you to know that. Very pretty. Is that, that the one who did your trick, your muscle trickinella yes, picture, exactly. Eric Grave? Yes, exactly. He did the nurse also. Is he a famous photographer? He is. He's a famous uh, photo micrographer. And why do you know him? Oh, because we collaborated on the first edition of Parasitic Diseases. He, right. he photographed everything for the first edition. <coughs> so... It, this also used to be called Plumber's Itch. Plumber's Itch, why is plumber's that? Plumber's Itch. So the story that Dr. Harold Brown would tell about this one was that in, this, in the South, a lot of the houses are built off the ground. They're propped up on cinder blocks or wood to allow ventilation to occur underneath to keep the house cool. And of course it is cool underneath the house, right? So that's where all the dogs go, to lay down to sleep during mm-hmm. the daytime. And of course they do everything there. Uh, they sometimes drag their food into. <laughs> they certainly sleep a lot. They defecate. They urinate. Hmm. So now the plumber <laughs> is called in because there's a leak in the faucet or something, and he goes underneath the house to fix it. And in order to do that, he usually doesn't have a shirt on because it's too hot, right? So he lays down on his back, and he pulls himself underneath <laughs> the house and in doing so of course he slides across all that dog feces that's all over the place and later on lives to regret it because his entire back looks like a road map you know the larvae that 
that you yeah, have seen pictures of that. That's the, that's why I was saying I wow. see great pictures of horrible diseases. I'm not enjoying the visual you're giving me from. No, this, well, uh, that's why it was called plumber's <laughs> plumber's itch because the plumbers in the South used to routinely catch this by having to crawl underneath the house, and you you crawl on you you sort of pull yourself in so you can look up to the pipes. Yeah. And uh, your back is exposed. I have a house at the shore that has a yeah. crawl space, and I have crawled sure. underneath A crawl it, space. That's but I exactly. put plastic down first. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, these worms can actually leave the site of deposition and crawl away from How them, far so. can they crawl, Dixon? Six feet? Four feet? <laughs> four feet. Right, four feet. That's the other hookworm. Not six. The human well, hookworm, right? Less than four. They're all <laughs> less, than than six. Six. less than so six. So the human escape. hookworm is four feet, right? Yeah. That's, that's why you dig... Outhouse pits to six feet. Here, here. Yeah. here I remember here. that. Here, Dixon. here. That's brilliant of yeah. you. That's, you know, and I've forgotten so much virology, but you remembered so much parasitic diseases. Yeah, it's not brilliant at all. <laughs> I just made some parasite slides last week. That's oh, that's nice. That. Oh, that's nice. One yeah. of them has a picture of an outhouse. Yeah, well, I took that picture. Courtesy of you. That's right. Uh, Daniel, is there anything else we need to mention about this? I was impressed as Nick was uh, commenting about how good a job people do in the U.S. with deworming their dogs. I've always been curious, like, how how well that is done. You know, we do that every month. That's my job, feeding Pippin, our little Cocker Spaniel, his... um, Pippin. Pippin. You have a little, uh, you have a, you little worm, his little worm, Bill. Do you have a Mary as well? Uh, so it, you're right. It actually comes from Tolkien. It's Pippin is one of the buddies, one of the... Uh, one of Frodo's buddies. Of Frodo's Pippin and Mary. Do you know the play Pippin? No, I never That's saw a it. a remarkable play. Is it about a Tolkien story? No. No, no it's a different story. It's, it's about... A, it's, it's almost like Damn Yankees. It's about someone who thinks he's uh, better than everybody else. And the devil makes a deal with him to give him everything he wants while he's alive as long as he promises to give the devil his soul. And, you know, it's a kind of like... Got a, it. We routinely give our dog ivermectin. Yes. For right. heartworm. Right? Are we not afraid of inducing resistance by giving drugs out so frequently? Are we? Know. Yeah, I would be afraid, but, you know, this is common <laughs> practice. All the vets do it. And I know they do because they yeah. that's what yeah. they're taught how to do it but uh, I just wondered what the and my wife loves it because she used to work on ivermectin so <laughs> right. she has no problem right, right, she says right. don't you dare withhold this from my <laughs> dog exactly <laughs> now hopefully people enjoyed that case and, and it looks like most people got it right so uh, right and the, and young the rest lady, got it wrong um, for reasons that were intellectualized and that was there was some reason for them saying that they just didn't blindly guess what was the lady's reaction to uh, your diagnosis was she grossed out and now, now she, she was, was okay. She was, you know, very happy that you figured know, it out. Yeah, that, yeah. That there was a diagnosis. There was something she could do. Yeah, and it, and it, presumably with treatment, it heals, and there are no scars. No, no. Actually, it healed very well. And it, I'm always curious. You know, this is one of those things that you see with a reasonable frequency. And uh, but I think she was surprised the first she'd ever heard that this was even something to worry about on vacation. So maybe we'll yeah. get the word out. Maybe our listeners, when they go on vacation, be careful. Um, we'll be careful. We'll make sure they put something down or lay on a chair or. Wear some shoes when they're well, going for a walk. You got to wear shoes. You can't even just stand up, man. I, and that's the thing. Like you go, you, you <laughs> that's know, true. The, certain areas, right? There's that um, area in Mexico where people like to go south of Cancun. I guess it's mm-hmm. the, um, you know, what they call that, the Mexican Riviera down there. Yep. Yeah. And yep. there, there is resort after resort after resort. That's so true. even if you go for a walk, you're still in. Yeah, resort, I've that route. In it's... resort areas, this is more of a problem when you go to a place where there's a resort, but then once you step outside the resort, you're yeah, in areas where there's right. dogs, etc. So if you go for those long walks, wear your flip flops, wear your tevas, wear sandals. Don't lay down on the beach. All right. Shall we do a paper? You bet. Daniel, you picked this, right? I did, did. actually. Uh, tell us why you picked it. <laughs> I like it. I think it's it was, a very interesting it paper. Great. It's a great paper. <laughs> yep. This comes from Brazil. I, I picked it for a number of reasons. Because um, it comes from a place that's named after my sailboat. <laughs> what, what is the name of your it's sailboat? It's a Bahia. A oh, Bahia. Okay, look at that. <laughs> Which is a big region. That was, that's perfect. Uh, there, were, there were a lot of aspects of this paper that I really liked. But one of the, one of the neat things, and, and I think next time we're going to be talking about a, a paper that has a similar gist where it's other things other than us and actually pretty big things in this case are um, manipulating our immune system and this is a story about an insect that has the ability to manipulate our immune system and i thought that was a, sort of a fascinating um story 
And I think next time we've said we're going to talk about how the microbiome manipulates our um, immune system. But I thought this was fascinating. It was bringing um, leishmaniasis and sand flies and our immune system all together. Interleukin-10 dominant immune response and increased risk of cutaneous leishmaniasis after natural exposure to Lutsomaya intermedia sand flies. Is that how you say it, Dixon? Lutsomaya? It exactly how you Lutsomaya. say it. Lutsomaya. It's a perfect pronunciation, Vincent. The first author is Augusto Carvalho, and the last author is Camila de Oliveira, and they're all from Brazil. Brazil. The, uh, the play Oswaldo Cruz uh, Institute, right? Famous place. What did Oswaldo Cruz did do? He discovered Chagas disease. There you go. <laughs> so they have an institute. And named, named it after, after his good friend Carlos Chagas. Carlos Chagas. How'd you like to have a name, Carlos Chagas? Would you like that, Dixon Chagas? I would like a <laughs> no. I, I always I always used to say I would rather have a, a cure named after me than a disease. The key here is that when, when these sand flies bite you, their, their saliva contains, as Dixon once said a long time ago on TWIP, and probably many times before that, <laughs> that they inject you with a pharmacopoeia. They do. A veritable cabinet of drugs. They do. To get you ready for blood withdrawal? Yeah. Basically? Mostly. But this is different. Yeah, but you know what? This is weird. What we're going to see here is weird. the effect on, on Leishmania, this right? This is weird. And apparently Very in mice, weird. there's some evidence that just giving mice saliva from these vectors sets you up for yes. infection. Is that correct, Dixon? I think what it says is that... They are more susceptible to the damaging effects of Exacerba- the infection. We once call they that catch exacerbating, it. right? Exactly. Right. So you, it, if you inject the mice with saliva the and then you infect them with, yeah, it, right. it gets a worse disease, right? That's right. I, I think Curious. it also does relate to susceptibility because not every animal that gets bitten by a lutsamaya that has promastigotes in its proboscis gets infected, right. but the ones that have been bitten again and again and again, they do. So you're right. They they are more susceptible. In people, they did a study a while ago yeah, showing they did. they're more positive people for leishmania among people who are seropositive to the saliva of the fly. Right. So how would you do that study? It's really int- very simple, Dixon. Actually. How did they do that, Vincent? I don't even want to know how they did it. This is how I would do it. <laughs> I would. You would take what would you one do? blood sample from. Yes. You go to a village where there's yes. leishmania yes. anywhere you'd like here in Brazil. Probably tons of it. You take five cc of blood from people. You have to get their permission, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. And you take that five cc, you let it clot, and you make serum. And then you take a little bit, and you check it for antibodies to fly salivary proteins. The and then you take another bit, and you look for antibodies how against that, leishmania. How about that? Right? There's a diagnostic for being infected. Of course. And that probably that's what they did, right? <laughs> and so they found if you had antibodies to fly saliva... You more likely had antibodies to leishmania, su- suggesting you're more even because you were bitten more often. However, there's a caveat here that I just love. Ah, oh, that could be one explanation, I love couldn't the it? Caveat. Yeah, it is. It is. What's the caveat, Dixon? Well, I, I highlighted <laughs> it in black just to show you that I've actually read all of the materials <laughs> and messages. You just read one sentence. I'll read the sentence. No, I'll read the sentence. It says, "This is when they were looking for." Um, humoral immune responses in individuals exposed to uh, Leishmania intermedia, no, Lutsamaya intermedia, sand flies. And they said, there was no significant difference between individuals who are seropositive and those who were seronegative to Lutsamaya intermedia saliva regarding age, sex, and most epidemiological features. The one exception was the documentation that seropositive individuals more frequently arrived home after 4 p.m. And I bet you didn't know what that meant. I did. You did know what that <laughs> Daniel meant? Daniel was going to tell us. Well, no, I was speaking to you this time. <laughs> you want me to explain what it well, means? Well, try. It's evening. That's when the flies bite. Everybody knows that. Wow. Even here in New York. They also bite early in the Even morning. Even down in yeah. lower Manhattan. They, are, they, they are, bite early in the morning and yeah. late at night. You're absolutely correct, Vincent. What do they do in between, Dick? I'm sorry that I underestimated they your rest. intellectual. They rest. <laughs> are, no, they you, are, are you trying to wind me up, dude? <laughs> 
Sorry, Daniel. I'm very oh, I just sorry. wanted to use this one of my favorite words in the world: it's crepuscular. That's after four p.m. Crepuscular <laughs> is to bite at dawn or dusk. They they tend not to bite in the middle of the day. Which is why this is in some places called chicleros ulcer because chiclero is the secretion from the chicle tree that the chiclero harvesters gather to turn it into chewing gum, and that's where the word chiclet comes from. Mm-hmm. Got it. And the chicleros that get there early get most of the secretions, and those are the people most likely to have these big lesions on their ears and things like yeah, their that. Their ears are exposed while they're doing this, and so that's where exactly. the sand flies bite them, and they end up with these ulcerations. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So there's the a ears. wonderful sociology to this as well as okay. immunology. So let's back up, yes. tell them how this was done. This is done, I think is very clever the way they did this. Yeah. So this was done in Brazil, in Bahia. Mm-hmm. They have... 264 people who were household contacts of people who had leishmania. But these people did not have leishmania themselves. Right. They were just household contacts. Right. right, exactly. They lived in the same house, right? Meaning what? They might have gotten bitten, just no, like the others They all did. got bitten, but it means that the number of infected sandflies versus the number of sandflies is low. We do a paper well, about that not too long ago. We did. That, yeah, we that did. was some other. We did. I mean, about only... how, oh, that was about how food limitation increases the likelihood that you'll get infected because the number of See that? vectors decreases. See that? So you have See a higher probability. Right. I mean, could... there's only one vector born infection that I know of in which the, the vector is 50% infected. And that's with Lyme disease in Westchester County and ticks. Mm-hmm. Mosquitoes in Africa, 1% or less. Lutsamaya, 1% or less. So you can have a family of people. Lots of bites, almost no infections. So they asked which of these 264 people had antibodies to fly saliva. 56%. That's amazing. And you know they have a control group. Right. Where would you get a control group? Well, you'd go where Lutzamaya is not. You can find such places? You can find such places. How how do you do that? Uh, Well, you do serological surveys, and you (laughs) find that (laughs) those are the ones that didn't react at all, so they mustn't have any sand flies. (laughs) You can do entomological surveys also. Okay. Um, That was interesting that they went to these areas with sand flies. There's actually people not getting bit, or people getting bit so little that they're not getting. I mean, in the cities, if you're raised in the cities of Brazil, it's probable that you're not exposed to sand flies because they don't live in cities. They live in rural areas, suburban areas. They live near the burrows of animals, basically. That's that's where they live. Okay. So they picked 19 of these people that had the highest antibody levels. Right. And they looked at isotypes. Right, meaning? IgG2 comes in one, two, three, four isotypes, slightly different sequences, right? Exactly, exactly. And they found that IgG1 and 4 were the main ones found, and 4 was higher than 1. Right. Okay. And that's an interesting. I mean, we'll pause there and and just tell people about the subclasses of ant. Like, what is up with that? Um, and I, I put a line under some two lictics, and I read off. So. <laughs> and, I'm sure you uh, read it twice. I only no, read and, it once. And why, why do we care about different IG? So we'll just, just give people a refresher because yes, um, sure. they're probably not immersed in immunology. So there are different types of immunoglobulins or antibodies. Um, and we'll start with A. IgG A and IgA is actually the antibody that we make the most of. We make grams of this a day, and it's a secretory antibody, and it it lines our mucosal surfaces, so inside of our nose, um, down through the GI tract, and it's part of this barrier. We have IgD, immunoglobulin right. D. IgD. That's I'm not really sure what that does. It's an early <laughs> precursor for the other immunoglobulins. I thought. I have to say. Um, all the immunoglobulins start off as IgM. We'll get to that. IgD, it's not really clear what it does. And, yeah. and I've spent a lot of time uh, trying to uh, understand uh, IgD. Uh, and I, and uh, I think people are still trying to see where. And, and it's not in all animals. In certain animals, IgD has kind of gone away. But uh, So I'm going to leave IgD up there and say, okay, we don't. I don't really know what that really does. Right. Um, but IgA is the secretory one. Ig, we're going to go to M. We're going to skip around the alphabet. All of our antibodies start off as IgM, and then they class switch to the other ones. Right. Um, IgM is a very broadly reactive. It can bind to a lot of things. It doesn't bind very tightly, so it's sort of your broad-spectrum immunoglobulin subclass. And often it'll be a 
group of like five of them, pentameric, together to mine things. And then we have IgG, right. immunoglobulin G. And this is our targeted, specific, um, refined through mutations to get better binding capacity. And in humans, I will say there are four major types of IgG, one, two, three, four. Four is unique. We think about antibodies as binding things um, and targeting them so the rest of the immune system, the cells can come along and grab them. But there's something called complement. And complement is a bunch of proteins in the, in the serum, in the plasma. Um, plasma is probably better to say. Yeah. And IgG one, two, and three can trigger the complement cascade. IgG4 doesn't. So IgG4 is kind of unique in that way. Huh. So let's say you're a parasite, a microbe, any kind of a pathogen that is vulnerable to attack by the immunoglobulin system, IgG system, and you can somehow trigger more <laughs> IgG4, you can yeah. actually have a survival advantage That's if right. complement is something that can be destructive to That's you. Right. So right. early here we're seeing that there looks like there's something going on where we're getting a lot of IgG4, which can't properly bind complement. Right. All right. Right. <clears throat> the next thing they did was to take some peripheral blood mononuclear cells from these 19 people, and they measured cytokine production. And uh, these are people, again, that had antibodies to the salivary proteins right. of the fly. right. Those people who had exposed, been exposed by measure of having antibodies had higher levels of IL-10 right. compared to people who right. didn't have antibodies. IL-10, right. interleukin-10, one so of your favorite sticks. Can it? we pause a moment? You have to go to the <laughs> because, bathroom? No, no, because I want to read you the Wikipedia... <laughs> You know, Definitely. there was a day. There was a time years ago when Dixon poo pooed Wikipedia. I think it's funny now. No, it's you, actually come a long way. In the you, last five you years, it's come it. a long way. You come revere long way. it. So this is an official definition of IL-10. Because I had to look it up. I mean, I you know what is IL-10 anyway? So this is the summary statement: the protein encoded by this gene, and they give us the gene is a cytokine. It's a, the gene is on chromosome number one, by the way is a cytokine produced primarily by monocytes and to a lesser extent by lymphocytes. This cytokine is pleiotropic in immunoregulation and inflammation. For instance, it downregulates the expression of Th1 cytokines, MHC class two antigens, and co-stimulatory molecules on macrophages. It also enhances B cell survival, proliferation, and antibody production. So it favors Th2 responses, it downgrades Th1 responses. Take a wild guess, Vincent, which immune responses are protective against leishmaniasis? That intracellular pathogen. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> <laughs> With toll like no, no. The one that's not that the way. viral one. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a viral type. Th1? Yeah. Th2 is viral antibody mediated mainly, right? Th2 is. Not going to work against this infection. Right, not an and intracellular so guy. The salivary gland proteins of the vector right. induce a cytokine which favors the production of antibodies which won't protect against it's the infection. Are you saying it skews the immune response? Well, I think the, I think the good think doctor on my right would say yes. I like skewing, I like mod um, modulating it. We haven't in a finished way. the definition though. <laughs> it says this cytokine can block NF kappa B activity, which is part of the innate immune system and huge in terms of a crossroads of whether it goes in this direction or that direction or the other direction. NF kappa B is a uh, hub molecule and is involved in the regulation of JAK stat signaling pathway. Now, would you please refresh our memories as to JAK stat? <laughs> Could well, eat the, no the fat. Ja the jack, the jack stat <laughs> pathway is activated when interferon binds oh, to its receptor, and it turns on the synthesis of okay. interferon-stimulated genes. So this guy, and NF kappa B, you know, turns on a subset of cytokines, not okay. all of them. So this is clearly skewing, right? Uh, the, the response, right? So there, there are mutations of this gene that result in clinical conditions, like what? Um, lupus. Hmm. Uh, our, uh, asthma. There's a whole list. In fact, I actually have another paper here that I took. 
liberties of pathological patterns of interleukin 10 expression, a review. Mm. And it has lots of different pathological conditions associated with aberrations of the interleukin system, interleukin 10 system. You know what the, the bottom line here is, Dixon? Tell me. The immune system is very intricately it's balanced. It's, it's balanced. Just, well, it is fabulous, too. Yeah. yeah. But if you skew it in one way or another, things go wrong. Right. And, for example, there are some vaccines that have been developed that yes. do not induce the proper Th1, Th2 balance that, the, say, the virus would do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those vaccines are no good. Oh. And we don't use them. So if you're wondering about this, folks, we don't use those To vaccines. continue the <laughs> definition, it says mutations in this gene are associated with an increased susceptibility to HIV-1 infection and rheumatoid arthritis. Not surprising. And that's just the tip of an iceberg. So what a interesting molecule to control. Well, this will... This story will evolve in a few minutes here, as you will see. Yeah, I think it's I think it's interesting. I sort of paused at this point and said, "Okay, we're reading a paper here about leishmaniasis, but why? What's what's the evolutionary pressure on this?" Ah, uh, well, that's fly? really interesting. This is really interesting. Why did the sandfly get to skew? Yeah, it's not for leishmania. No, it's I don't, not. I don't think it is. No, it, can't it be. may be that leishmania ended up in this host because of this. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you can imagine many years ago the fly picking up lots of different pathogens, and this one said, "Ah, I need this skewed response." <laughs> That's right, and it's and it stayed in that fly. But yeah. there must be a reason why the fly does this. Yes, I don't know why. <laughs> it doesn't actually have to have a really good reason. Sometimes things are there, but and I, it's just I like random. Think, you know, it reminds like me of a <laughs> Ogden Nash poem. What's that? It says, "The Lord, in His wisdom, created the fly." And then forgot to tell us why. Kind of similar. Another so, way of putting it is just because there's a phenotype doesn't mean there was selection. Uh, there you go. That's also true. Right. That's a scientific true. way. Yeah. No, I, th I, think there is a, I think there is a good reason. For the fly? He's going to give us well, so I, I thought this through. Like, well, what's the advantage here? <laughs> and so I, I'll go back to figure one a little bit. One of the things we, we mentioned there is you're getting this IgG response, but you're not getting an IgE response. Oh. And what is I, IgE is sort of our oh. allergic response, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, let, let's think about why do we care when we get bit by a fly? Like, let's say you went out and flies bit you, and it was much like the kissing bug. It was painless. Yep. didn't cause much of a response. Yep. Yep. Would you care? Would you go out of your way to avoid it? No, you would not. We go out of our yeah. way because they're itchy and yeah, they yeah, get yeah, raised yeah. and right. they irritate us. Now, what if a fly? Mm, so that's an IgE could response. Bite, that yeah, an, it's an uh, I, well, it's a combination. An energy to its There's an IgE region. that's going to give us the histamine, right? It's going to bind to mast cells, give yeah. us mm -hmm. a histamine. There's also a Th1 cellular response that gives us the swelling. That's so true. We've got both things going on. So what if a fly? Had a, had a mutation where when it bit a person, let's say it in its progeny, when it bit you a few times, you stopped having such a robust response. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't mind so much. And so I think the selective advantage for Maybe. the fly is that skewing away from IgE, not getting an IgE response, skewing away from a cellular response and more of an IL-10, is that if you bite people a whole bunch of times, they seem not to get as robust a response to the fly bites. Uh, you know, that makes a lot of sense, but this is a population effect, and it kind of worries me in terms of okay. selection. There's no advantage for that fly, because he may never see that host again, but another fly might. But his progeny. It's an altruistic. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's altruistic, yeah. and that that's not without precedent, but, yeah. you know, there are... We've, we were talking about this on TWIM, there are molecules that bacteria produce, which are public. They're called public goods. They benefit the population, not just that one bacterium, but the population, say, in the soil. And if you, if if a mutant public good arises, there is no selection pressure for it to, for that individual to remain because everyone else benefits. So there's very little selection for mutations in that to say to drug resistance or inhibitor resistance. So this is a similar thing. This. What you're saying, Danny, would would benefit all the flies that are going to come and bite. So well, it's gonna it's gonna a population that has a higher rate of this mutation. Mm -hmm. Those flies are going to do better. Let's say across Maybe. the river, they haven't gotten this mutation introduced in their population. They're going to get swatted. The people are going to stay indoors. Across the river, they're like, ah, I don't mind these flies, and so wait, those flies wait, are going to have better you're access. You're making an assumption here, and I I might take exception to this one. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I really might because 
It's not obvious that the itching sensation is induced by the biting of the fly itself or whether it's after the fly leaves. Like, for instance, a mosquito bite. It's after they leave. It's not during. You can watch them. Mm-hmm. You sit there and mm-hmm. you watch them and they'll, they'll bite you and nothing happens. Then they leave and a little while later you start to get an itch. Yeah, well, he's saying it's for the ones that come after. Yeah, but right? it, it wouldn't... But it's also... Um, yeah. It's a it's a population thing because if you get bitten by this kind of fly and you have no itching or you're going to go out and risk being bitten again, you don't worry about it. I don't know if that really is a selection. Yeah, but I think there though. is, and as you're saying, there is a delay. This isn't going to mean the bite hurts less. It just means you're not going to get all covered in itchy bumps yeah. down right. the road. Right. right and right, so again, right. you will, you'll be like, I, I don't care. But if you if you go out and get and you're covered in these itchy bumps and you don't even want to go to work or deal with people, yeah. you're going to avoid that. Yeah. Um, uh, I have to run this by my evolution colleagues. People yeah, who move to idea. endemic areas uh, have, are filled with stories like this. And then at the beginning, the first year, they were inundated with bites and they scratched all like crazy, like Peace Corps workers. Mm-hmm. The second year, blocking antibodies appear, the itching goes away, they don't mind it at all. And they tell, don't worry, you'll get over it. Mm-hmm. How interesting. You'll go get out, over Go out it. there and get bitten, don't you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, I mean, little kids in Africa, they've estimated these little kids are bitten thousands of times every day. In, yeah. In right, the height right. of the mosquito season, that's incredible. How could you stand being bitten that many times unless they don't matter? Unless they don't leave a residuum yep. of itching. And then that's, that's what I meant to say. The next right. experiment they do is they take these PBMCs. Right. And, yes. In culture, and they add saliva. Mm-hmm. Right. And then they look at the cells, what's happening to them. Ah. And here's where Daniel's going to weigh in. They find that the CD4 positive, IL10 positive cell population increases. Yes. Selection. When you add saliva to Selection. these patients' right. PBMCs. Right. You amplify this. So this is a CD4, which is a, a T lymphocyte subset, Right. Yeah, it's. I guess what I would say is, is the percent of cells that are secreting IL-10 goes Increases, up. So, right. so we'll make the distinction here: is that there are cells that are always making IL-10, and that's probably pretty rare. And there are then cells that, when provoked, make IL-10. Mm-hmm. And so what they're doing is here is when they provoke the cells, um, the CD4 cells, the T cells, right. Um, you see a higher percent of them secrete IL-10. And we're, we're, we're talking about 1%. This is a huge. It's not a lot, but if yeah. you look outside the CD4, because this becomes the issue, who's making the IL-10? Is it macrophages? Is it B cells, dendritic cells? Who could? It, it's actually, it's the CD4 cells that are making the IL-10. And when provoked, we see this induced IL-10 production. Now, Daniel, they make a point of looking at the CD4 positive, CD25 positive, positive compartment Mm -hmm. what's the significance of cd25 it's actually really interesting um this is in a sense i'll say the frightening aspect these are regulatory Mm t-cells so in addition to just this oh we're making il-10 these are t-cells that are specialized for suppression and tolerance and basically telling the immune system don't you worry about this this is all fine Nothing to see here. Move along. <laughs> so they, the classic markers are CD4 positive, CD25 positive, and they even will sometimes do an intracellular Fox P3 staining. Mm-hmm. Maybe some of our listeners have heard of that. So these are these are T regulatory cells that they're talking about. Are you saying they're foxes inside of these T cells? Exactly. Yes. Wow. <laughs> it's actually. I didn't know they could fit. Uh, foxes. Uh, <laughs> We, we talk about these sort of master regulators, and the Fox P3 is a um, master regulator. So what you're saying, Daniel, is that in the presence of saliva, you're increasing the number of suppressive T cells. Yes, T cells with foxes inside of them. That can suppress some aspect of the immune response. That sounds like a skewing, doesn't it? It certainly does. It's, um, well, more even than a skewing, it's an induction of tolerance. <clears throat> So that what do these suppressors act on? Like what arm of the immune response? Well, this is, is it general? This is um, the challenge with our immune system is we have these T regulatory cells, we'll call them. Mm-hmm. They've, they've actually undergone name changes through the years, but now T regulatory is what we use them. They have the ability to um, regulate all the cytotoxic T cells, Mm-hmm. They can regulate other T cells. They can regulate macrophages. 
All right, um, so a broad range. So it's broad. They, okay. Now, somebody tells them initially, we think, that they need to do this, but then they're the ones out there yeah, sort of okay. sending the message to the troops. Okay. All right, the next experiment is cool. Now they take macrophages. They take blood monocytes, make them into macrophages in culture. And these are uh, from the, some of these individuals who were exposed to saliva. Uh, then they infect them right. with leishmania in culture. With, yes. In the Pro presence or absence of saliva. And they found that when you add saliva, you increase the percentage of infected cells, but not a lot. But more importantly, the number of intracellular amastigotes. The parasite load per cell goes up. That's just another fancy word for yeah. the load. It goes yeah. up inside yeah. each yeah. cell. Yeah. 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 And you have saliva there. And guess what? If you add antibody to IL-10. <laughs> inhibit the in- yep. goes back to normal. So that's very so. This, yeah, this is a beautiful experiment. I like this. This is they bring it all together and they say, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We think it's the this is all IL ten mediated or IL ten right. mediates this. And if we neutralize IL ten, the effect goes away. So, so. somehow the IL ten is allowing more infection. Would you say? Mm-hmm. A higher percentage of macrophages are being infected, and There's the more. number of amastigotes per macrophage right. is going up as well. So. And they show both. They show. Okay. So your your conclusion there, Vincent, would be that something is happening to the interferon system that's preventing it from being stimulated, and therefore you get a higher replication rate in the infectious agent. Is that what you're thinking? I don't know if it's interferon or what aspect of uh, immunity it is. I don't know what is protective here in this case. Yeah. But it's just, all I would say is that IL-10 is somehow interfering with a normal process that would prevent right. or that would limit infection, say. Right. 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 The last thing they did was to follow these people for three years. That's really remarkable. So remember, these were people who easy. had antibodies. Half of them had antibodies to saliva. They hadn't yeah. been infected. Nope. They were seronegative for leishmania. And they followed them for three years and asked, did they seroconvert? So I, I periodically right. they would take blood and right. test them for antibodies. Right. 18% of those individuals who had antibodies to saliva developed cutaneous leishmaniasis. You are right. 8% in people who did not have antibodies yeah, 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 yeah. to saliva. It's remarkable. So is it, it doesn't prove it, but it's a good correlation. If you have antibodies right. to saliva, you have a higher chance of being infected, right? Yeah, which sort of seemed obvious, right, even before you did all the science, that if you're getting bit by sand flies a lot and... It's evident by your immune response. You're probably more likely to get. How many times do you have to be bitten to make an antibody That's a good response? Question. That's the thing. If you get it after the first bite, then that factor, I think, is yeah. ruled out. That complicating factor you could discard. Primes the immune response, though. And the next bite probably jumps it up to an IgG response rather than an IgM. But I think it was key that they showed this, that there's actually this correlation that you see these people. These are the ones with this, we believe, skewed immune Response and here they are, twice as likely to get twice. cutaneous leishmaniasis. Is there an intervention you could do that would actually test this in some way? If you could somehow give them something that would prevent the skewing of the immune response by the by the saliva, I'm not aware of any. But <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Well, you know, you, this is something that's sort of hitting the press recently is the secondary benefits to BCG and this idea that certain things, BCG may not just be about TB, it may be skewing things towards a TH1 in areas where that might be important. And leprosy apparently mm. has a role. Um, yeah, I wonder, do you, do you give these people a, a booster of BCG? Maybe you can counteract this skewing. Um, I, I think at this point it's still open to uh, speculation, ideas, research. So Dixon, they they speculate that because T regulator so T reg cells are involved, um, it's it's a suppression of what they call the effector response, the cellular effector response, not in not interferon as you asked before. But I think you'd have to look at yeah. that more. And then okay, so then I downloaded another paper, <clears throat> which was about the development of vaccines for Leishmania. And there's a very interesting quote in the abstract. It said, Leishmaniasis is a parasitic disease that encompasses a range of clinical manifestations affecting people in tropical and subtropical regions of the world. 
Epidemiological and experimental data indicate that protection from disease can be achieved in most people. In addition, now listen, this is the, the sentence that blew me away. We know how the host immune system must respond to infection in order to control parasite growth. So this paper was written in 2014. And if I look through the review, and it's a review, <clears throat> it says what the protective immune responses are. And they are listed. They require factors produced by CD4 plus T cells. Uh-huh. They, there you go. <laughs> I know, I know. That's right, exactly right, which is why this seems to work out very well. They do indicate that uh, interferon gamma production promotes parasite persistence in spleen tissue. It says autocrine inhibition of interferon gamma production. I'll read the whole sentence. I think that doesn't make sense otherwise. These, uh, let's see, the CD4 responses in human uh, visceral larval Visceral leishmaniasis patients. Now, these are the most severely affected patients. These effects include the discovery that interleukin-10 produced by CD4 plus T cells is a potent autocrine inhibitor of interferon gamma production and promotes parasite persistence in spleen tissue from visceral, larva, visceral leishmaniasis patients. Thus, interleukin-10 has been identified as a potent therapeutic target for use in combination with drug therapy or to improve therapeutic vaccine efficacy. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Now, <laughs> IL-10 IL doesn't have any effect on this on the Treg population. It's just something that's produced by the I think cells, of it more right? as something produced by yeah. the T regulatory cells. So they're using it as a marker here initially. That, that's what turned them on to this pathway that IL-10 yeah. was up. Yeah. You know, interestingly, interferon gamma was also up in the seropositive people. <laughs> there was, it, yeah, it wasn't just IL-10. I actually I, I marked the couple that were up. And, and the, the way you do these, you, it's sort of nice, let's say figure three is what we're looking at, is there are these wonderful um, bead array things where you can stimulate cells and then collect the supernatant and test and say, well, what about interferon gamma or TNF or IL-10 right. or right. IL-13? TNF or was not you can do a whole. Yeah. And so what they did see is it wasn't just yeah. um, it wasn't just IL-10 that was up. Yeah, other things uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah. CCL2, which is a monocyte um, <coughs> chemokine. chemokine. Yep. Um, IL-13, which was which was up. <laughs> What is the number of <laughs> interleukins that we're up to, by the way? Not, oh, yeah. <laughs> up the, the, the 40s or the 50s? Young, uh, <laughs> the young lady on Twiv last week, yeah. Stephanie, gave us a chart, which is immense, of all the chemokines and cytokines. Crazy. It looks like an old-fashioned telephone switchboard. <laughs> so, Daniel, what do you think is the fly protein that's doing this, and how is it doing it? Uh. No, I don't know exactly. And that would I think be interesting. I think that's it? great. I mean, we have this pharmacopoeia, right? And they actually, I think they break down that there's a number of um, proteins that you can actually sort of spread out on a gel. And the interesting issue would be identify which exact protein is doing this. And then can you neutralize that, prevent it from having this effect? Or can you utilize it? Again, this sort of the plowshare concept. If we're sure. becoming tolerant to leishmaniasis, wouldn't it be nice to be tolerant to a kidney transplant? Or a liver transplant. Look at you. Or so is there some yeah, way right. of um, right. utilizing this to our advantage? Because we would sure. love to sure. induce, um, stably induce T regulatory cells, keep them induced, keep them tolerating these things. Yeah. That's a, it's a big area of research and transplantation, right? Yeah. It's how, to, how to yeah. really get the T regulatory cells. Currently, we use very blunt instruments to <laughs> immunosuppress, right? Oh, we, we destroy uh, the immune system. We cripple it <laughs> instead exactly of, right. you know, I mean, here we have a sand fly with more elegance in the manipulation <laughs> of our immune system than, than right. you know, us with our degrees. <laughs> Looks like about a dozen proteins in the saliva. That's a lot, though, isn't guys. it? Yeah, that's more, than, that's more than three, right? <laughs> more than three, right? I remember we had Dr. Gwads on a long time ago. By the way, for the listeners out there, he has now since retired from the NIH. And I remember him saying uh, on one of our shows that the two, um, Kyllocene and Anopheline mosquitoes, arose at different times in evolution. And yet, their salivary glands contain similar pharmacologically active biomolecules, but they're totally different molecules for each of the two groups. 
ones that they both contain anticoagulants, they both contain analgesics and analgesics mm-hmm. and anesthetics and vasodilators, but they're different molecules. So co parallel evolution. You need to do something and eventually you'll end up doing it. What's the fly in, in uh, Africa that transmits Tetsi. it? So do you think the saliva of the tsetse would have a similar effect? It's a pretty harsh bite. Yeah, I wonder. Tsetse's yeah, are tough. Yeah, they don't seem like they've you really... No, <laughs> when you've been... It's like being bitten by a horse fly. Hmm. They have um, blades that they use to sever the blood vessels with. They, they're very fast feeders. What's the fly with the P in the name? Palips? It's another Leishmania fly. Glacina. Palidipes. Oh, no, no, I know which one. You mean the... Uh, the phlebotomus. Those right. are the old world sand flies. Okay. Papatasi. And they Papitasi. transmit Leishmania? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So would they do this? Probably. They do. They do. In fact, they do did they, some does of their, their work from hurt? patients in, in uh, India. I believe that they had some sera that they... Some other had. studies? Yeah. I was just... I was getting distracted here by this. They actually went ahead, as Vincent was saying, which, which proteins in the saliva right. are driving this. And they were... What they were saying is the people who tend to have this um, response tend to have antibodies targeting um, three particular Oh, this is a Western blot. A Western. Oh, this is a Western. So the dozen proteins is on a Western blot. So there may (laughs) be even more. There may be more. Yes, these are, are, they're basically running on all the proteins, and they're saying, which of these proteins do people have antibodies to? That's right. And then saying there's three in particular. So there's even more proteins in there. This is based upon the antibody response. Right. And they, they've got it down saying these three are the ones that we think might be. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. But it may not be the proteins. It may be the ones we don't have an immune response exactly. to. Exactly. <laughs> which, which you'd almost think that would make more sense because it's all about immune evasion. And yeah, because we, yeah. the antibody may not have any role in this whole thing, right? Yeah. You're yeah. using it as a surrogate. So you really need a mass spec and these are the proteins yeah. and you yeah. identify them. Or you know, you can go back to the sequence and yeah. you put each protein individually in and see which one of these you know, is yeah. driving yeah. this. Yeah. All right, it's a cool paper. Yeah. Very nice. Exactly. And I guess that's it, right? <clears throat> well... Oh no! There's always more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like that. Do you have another case? No, we. Or have that's you right, run out? Right, have no, you we, run out? No, no, no I have not run out. You could the never world run is out. Not yet fully cured of parasitic diseases. That's for sure. Okay. Is everybody ready for? We a are case? ready. I'm ready. The spin doctor is on. <laughs> I'm going to type uh, what you say here. We are asked to consult by the OBGYN service. This is I'm on the infectious disease consult service regarding a pregnant woman who was just admitted to labor and delivery. This woman is full term and about to give birth, but there are concerns about a skin problem that the husband has. Uh, When the patient is seen, she's resting comfortably in bed with the husband there at the bedside. The woman reports no skin complaints or lesions, but the husband is reporting that he recently developed a very itchy skin problem. The husband reports that he travels for his company and they often have him stay in what he considers cheap hotels. <laughs> his last trip was about one month before he developed these current symptoms. He reports that the itchiness and rash involves the skin between his fingers oh, and that it becomes worse every night. <laughs> you know, <Okay. laughs> this could not have been a more propitious follow-up <laughs> than to... Prayer comments. Did you, do, did you do this on purpose? I you know, not. as I mentioned, I hadn't read the email, so this is great. <laughs> and uh, but I think with the if people listen to this episode, they might get some hints. Where um, did he, where did he go that last trip? Uh, apparently, he travels a lot in the Midwest. Uh-huh. Uh He is a healthy guy with no past medical history, no past surgical history. He's not allergic to anything. Uh, there is a family history of heart disease in his father. Um, he's not on any medications. Did he eat uh, ceviche? Uh, he does not report ceviche or sushi ingestion. You ask about his sexual that health. Was too, a, that's that's coming. That's actual, coming. That I know actual. he's sexually active. Apparently, his Absolutely. wife is pregnant. His wife is, she's, well, she's given birth. That's right. She is giving birth, and this is. Uh, I should mention this is her their first child. So this is the wife's first pregnancy. Hmm. Um, Why so, are they concerned? Um, 
Yeah, why are they concerned? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're concerned. Is there something we need to do? Is there something we should treat the wife? Could she so, potentially have this? Is this going to complicate so the birth? The and what, is he, and had what does no he clue. even have? So the obstetrician didn't know, right? <laughs> oh, they, they call us. They call they you. Say. Oh, yeah. It might be infectious. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Can you tell us, is there anything we should worry about? Right. Um, and I'll throw in a few things. So it's occupation. He, um, he's involved in sales, as I mentioned. So there's a lot of travel. Mm-hmm. He shakes a lot of hands, is what you mean. He lives with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Soon there'll be three of them. Um, he doesn't. He's not a drinker and doesn't uh, have what any does he sell? Does toxic he say habits. What he sells? No, no. What is he? What did he touch recently that he can remember? Uh, cheap hotels. <laughs> well, he says he says there's been no animals. Hasn't been exposed to any animals, but mm-hmm. he does rep report the cheap hotels he says he travels quite a bit he says usually to medium to large cities and this is throughout the east coast but then i as i mentioned all the way out to like oklahoma midwest area so this uh episode of his hand itching is this the first time he's uh, seen this this is the first time he's had this problem and it coincided with a month previous trip right well he he gives us this story you know people often tell a story yeah well they, that's a story that's right there, that's you, right. you need more information you know and he ate at a french restaurant a week ago i mean we don't we, you know <laughs> Did you, when <laughs> he right. said people cheap. try to put together they say i think i got yeah, yeah. this from because yeah, yeah, i stay yeah, in yeah. cheap hotels that's yeah. why so when he said this t- to you cheap hotels yes. did you did you query what do you mean by a cheap hotel? What what are the characteristics that make it a cheap hotel? Yeah, I I do of course. And what, I'm, I'm <laughs> most curious. I'm like really. And you stayed there. Tell me a little bit. And uh, you know there was a little bit of we'll say bitterness towards his em- employer that they don't provide him with yeah. better places. What to is stay. the uh, is the bed dirty? For example, that's what he would say. It's like sometimes the sheets don't look like they've been cleaned. Sometimes there's stains. Um, he seemed uh, a little bit upset by. Uh, uh. Yep. Okay. Now, do we want to make him step out in the hall and ask him any more detailed questions? Or you're you're okay? He's hanging out there with his wife, and you know, I don't have any sex questions because <laughs> uh, his his wife is pregnant. He's got this thing on his hands, you know. Yeah. Both so, hands, right? uh, both hands, or one hand? Oh, let's see what it says. Um, did I say which? Whether it was both? You didn't. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Wait, I would like to ask him that question. <laughs> Did you say it was? I'm sorry. One, you didn't say if it was both hands or one. I was looking to see if I if I made a note. Um, the husband mm-hmm. reports that he travels. Okay, um, between his fingers. Actually, it's both hands. Yep. Bilateral. Bilateral. Okay. Okay. Wonder if we'll that really that. matters. <laughs> I'll make a note. <laughs> both hands. We don't know, but. Um, hmm. Many suspicious and Any other questions, Dixon? Well, besides trying to guess at what it is, no. Now you're done? I think I am. I'm going to give you the physical, though. I'm going to tell you, because you know, we took a look at the hands. It's pretty but easy to look I could at the ask a, I could ask a very... A, a question that he may not give the correct answer to. And, uh, okay. And one of the questions would be, I mean, strictly speaking, your wife is in the delivery room, and I know that this seems like an inappropriate time to ask this question, um, but um, on these trips that you take, do you have other any, things going on in extra, those cheap hotel rooms extra. besides sleep? Do you have you had any sexual encounters with people other than your wife in the recent past? Who, who would go to so. his cheap hotel room with? Who, him? I, he probably <laughs> people are unlikely to reveal that information at that moment. Yeah. But that would be a question that would occur to me based on what I think this is. Okay. I'm going to say that's a that's a good question. You're going to give us an answer, though. No, I, <laughs> no well, you do, <laughs> dare not. I, well, no, I, I have to say, I you, know, you make a judgment call. And I ask myself, will the answer to that question change my management? Right, right. And, you know, and I say, you know, this man potentially could have had extramarital sexual affairs. Um and I'm just going to say that's a possibility in my head. I'm going to consider it. But um, unless it's going to change my management, I don't need to like step him out of the room and create a scene. He's a sensitive physician. A sense, yeah, a Did sensitive. you learn that in medical school? No, I, I, I would have <laughs> agreed entirely with that. That's why I hesitated yeah. to even raise the question. But it, once it's there, you have to ask. Well, here you're among friends. You can, we are among friends. Yeah, and if he came in all by himself without, oh, you know, yeah, his, so I would say, hey, is. you know. Yeah, sure. Because that might just that's right. order things in the differential. 
Yeah, that's great. Well, I go ahead and I examine him, and uh, he has these small um, papules mm -hmm. on his fingers, and between his fingers in the web spaces, and he has these, they're about a centimeter long, these brown lines, um, and it looks like there's a dot of clotted blood at the end of these brown uh, lines. Um, and there's minimal surrounding redness, um, but you can see that he's been scratching. Oh, yeah. Okay. I say, say that again. They're papules, you said? So there are these very small papules. They're between the fingers in the, in the web spaces. Right. Um, and he has these little brown lines, and it looks like there's a clot, like a tiny blood yeah. clot at the yeah. end of these yeah. little brown lines. Okay. Is that the end of And you this? can see that he's, yeah. And this, yeah. And you You're can see that You're not going to do a complete body examination. Here. That's all that we're seeing. We're not going to go ahead and examine the rest. See, because that's the next step that I would ask for. Other parts of the body? Absolutely. Where would you look? No, I would look at the whole body. Because there's a pattern. The, the thing that I'm thinking about, there's an associated... <laughs> yeah, no, this is good. An associated, I would dare I say, rash. And where do you want to look? Uh, I want to look. Uh, you want to look in the behind crotch, behind the knees, not instance. the crotch. Okay. No, not the crotch. Behind the, the knees, crotch. behind the knees, yeah. uh, along the trunk, where the belt line is, and on the chest. I would like to know what those areas look like. Okay. And we're not going to find that out, of course. But so he doesn't he doesn't report any other involved areas. But then again, we're not we're not stripping him naked there in front of his wife, right? And he's only had um, this for a month. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's a modifying feature of yep. this. Yeah. So I think that asking sex questions would be a good idea. But I think for you, your 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 uh, reason for not doing so is quite acceptable. Yeah. I don't I don't think it was going to change what we were going to do. Um, and I felt like we were going to be able to get the diagnosis without without going down that. Yeah. Right. right. Um, All right. Uh, there you go. Um, let me see if there's a few things here that we could go through. Yeah, there are a couple of short emails. Let's just go through some of them. First one is from Clark, who writes, I have been enjoying your podcast during my compute, I think he means commute, for some time, <laughs> knowing how Dixon likes fishing. <laughs> and both of your thoughts on parasite, non-parasite coevolution. I thought you might find the attached paper interesting. Oh. My interest is in foodborne, particularly fishborne parasites that may infect humans. Recently, the Japanese have linked kudota species with gastrointestinal illness. Please keep up the podcasts. Hmm. Clark is with the Division of Seafood Safety at the FDA. Nice, 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 nice. Well, you know, that's very interesting because I used to know the uh, director of that division. George Jackson, who's since retired, it's interesting to see who uh, has come in to so this, carry the torch. This paper is called, it's in Parasitological Research, The Muscle-Dwelling Mixozoan, Kudoa inornata, enhances swimming performance in the spotted sea trout, Sinocyon <laughs> nebulosus. I know the spotted sea trout. It's a game fish in the southern part of the United States. So the parasite... Hmm which dwells in the muscle of the trout. Makes it swim better. And How they actually put them through swimming tests. In this very paper. That's great. That's, that's fun research. So right? that, makes, <laughs> that's that is because the parasite wants to spread. Apparently. Right? And get Apparently. into new hosts. Apparently. Well, that's, what, that's our teleological Apparently. explanation of Apparently. it. Apparently. That is really cool. So they, they did this study thinking the parasite would reduce swimming performance, but the more parasites, <laughs> uh, they, they perform better. So my interpretation of this is that the people on the Olympic swimming team need to be infected with these parasites. <laughs> but you're, if you're not testing. a fish, I'm afraid there's some species specificity here for the And host. then, <laughs> yes, we'll have to test for this parasite. Right. <laughs> you don't think this would grow in human muscle? Uh, probably not. But no, because there's out. a temperature difference. I mean, there's a huge temperature difference. Dixon, if you ate this, would that be a problem? No. We eat a lot of things that don't give us problems. So this is a freshwater fish. No, it's not. It's trout? Oh, it's a sea trout. Sea, sea, so it's misnomered. It's not really a sea trout. It's like a weak fish. We have weak, weak fish, fish It's related yeah, yeah, to yeah, weak right. fish. They call them weak sea trout. That's so right. um, if you ate this raw, it wouldn't harm you? Is there anything else that would harm you? I didn't say that necessarily, although I don't think it would because I don't think your temperature profile fits this parasite's requirements. What's the worm that bit the young lady's stomach? That's a... Anasacus. And that's that was in um, 
some fresh caught fish by her boyfriend. Well, not it fresh. Was fresh water. It was not fresh. fresh water. It fish. was a salmon. He caught a salmon, and, and it was. Um, That's right, salmon. This. The parasite had crawled out of the gut tract into the muscle yeah. tissue, and, and that was different. Uh, when the fish dies, they start to go yeah, that's right, right in. Re- remember, right. the the mm. ultimate host is a warm-blooded animal. It's a sea-dwelling yeah, right. cetacean of some sort, or a pinniped. Pinniped. A pinniped. <laughs> anyway, this is a fun paper. Yeah. Uh, if you yeah, can, yeah, yeah. If you can uh, get right. it. Right. You can see how they measure fish swimming performance, <sighs> right? Right. Um, Dexon, you would like to read the next one. I shall. John writes, this video is worth a watch or a listen. Jimmy Carter talked about neglected tropical diseases. The American Medical AMNH. You know what oh, that the is. the American Museum of Natural History. There but you go. I'm sitting next to someone who actually shook the man's hand. Jimmy yeah, Carter? I was there. I was he was there. at that talk. Yeah, I, I shook Jimmy Carter's hand that night, and it was great. I, January, yeah. I, yes. yeah. I went to that, the opening night, and um, I sat next to and had a long conversation with the head of their guinea worm eradication mm-hmm. um, Which program. is why he was there. Is that yeah. why you got the little uh, filter thing? Yes, that's where I got yeah, all those right. uh, drinking straws. Right, right. We, uh, we um, took a picture of you with it, right? Yeah. We did. <laughs> um, Daniel, we want to take the next one? Tale of the Tapeworm, Squeamish Readers Stop Here. And there's a link there to a uh, New York Times um, health link. Oh, this is the fishworm story that you told yeah. years ago, Dixon, yeah. right? Yeah. The gefilte fish in the Bronx. That's true. You know, <laughs> this is by uh, an MD who writes for the. Oh, this is a 2006 article. This is oh, hugely old. Yeah, yeah, okay. So That's I thought even they before were. Before I was retired. <laughs> Do you make your own gefilte fish? Yes. Do you ever taste the raw fish before adding salt? Yes. <laughs> What's the name of this parasite, Dixon? Diphilobothrium latum. Very good. So you can find Dixon telling this story on a previous <laughs> twip. <laughs> uh, James writes, Kia ora, folks. Thought of you a lot when reading this article. Reminded me of some of the stuff Dixon has mentioned <laughs> in the past stuff. The articles in Ars Technica... Can America cope with a resurgence of tropical disease? Mm-hmm. Tales of neurocysticercosis oh, yeah. and Chagas disease in Houston. How about that? You know, whenever you have a few of these exotic cases, they I know, I know the headlines mean, and we're gonna get invaded. Get killed. So tell Chagas in Houston it must be an imported case, right, Dixon? No. It's Autochthonous? It's autochthonous. It can be. It, Texas has autochthonous cases of yeah. Chagas. But these are might be blood transfusions, and that would be uh, allochthonous. Allochthonous. And what about the neurocysticercosis acquired somewhere else? Yeah. Yeah. Our uh, pigs are pretty clean when it comes to exposure you know, to human feces. But I guess what we've seen, unfortunately, is that the immigrants will be carrying the tapeworm. That's and right. then they'll no, end that's up, right. yeah, it'll that's end true. up contaminating the food. People here, we've had a, a number of cases in Brooklyn yeah, no, and no, such. That's right, that's right. Then, um, yeah, that's so this, uh, the, this guy says it's a gathering crisis. So they talked to Peter Hotez. That's good. Peter Hotez was so concerned that he founded a school of tropical medicine at Baylor. <laughs> this we just this we just moved, right? Yeah, that's, well, not just, but he's been there, there a couple well. years. Yeah. Well, when we talked to him, he was still at uh, wherever the Sabin Foundation, Galveston. Galveston. Yeah. Peter says, what, "While we are calling them tropical diseases, the tropical part is probably a misnomer. Right. Most of the world's neglected tropical diseases are in wealthy countries. It's the poor living among the wealthy." There you go. So check that out. Yep. Thank you. James is from New Zealand. Yes. And um, we have one. It's the second from, letter we've had from New Zealand. Yeah, we had a couple of our guesses, right? Yeah, yeah. One, one from New Zealand and one from Australia. Exactly. You know, south of the uh, equator, they like their parasites. They do. Right. Michael writes, I've become quite the fan of TWIP as well as TWIV and TWIM. In addition to listening to the current episodes, I find myself spending far too much time working my way through the backlog and dreaming of the day where I placate my more OCD aspects and have listened to them all. (laughs) Yeah, I got it. I love listening to them while cooking and eating, which may sound strange to some, (laughs) since the topics aren't necessarily typical eating-friendly topics. But on the other hand, it does serve to keep me from avoiding any shortcuts in my food prep at cooking and cleanup. There you go. One nitpick, Uh which is, yes, a parasite joke. Please and thank you. The sign-off. While another (laughs) twip goes parasitic, does nicely parallel the one for twiv, I think I'd prefer 
another twip worms its way into your hearts <laughs> as being far more topical. Mm-hmm. Michael, P.S. So does the fact that all the acronyms for your respective podcasts start with twee and admission of your secret Twilight movies mm-hmm. books fandom leading us to the inevitable descent in Gotham by you all and the release of This Week in Vampirism? <laughs> <laughs> Only when it comes to spreading rabies. <laughs> uh, I don't think so, right? Yeah. But it's a clever um, yeah. thought. Yeah. This week in vampirism, episode number 1001, Dixon. <laughs> wow, we've done a lot of these. We have a lot of fangs out there to listen. <laughs> Ooh. Are you taking lessons from Alan Duff? Uh, no, maybe a little bit. All right. That'll do it for Twip 96. We have four more and we're done. <gasps> Finito? Aren't we stopping at 100? No, but we're going to pause. We are? Oh, are we yeah, pausing? we're going to pause and celebrate, and then we're going to move oh, okay. on. Okay. How are we going to celebrate? I don't know yet. Well, we'll have to discuss We'll it. think about it. Maybe our, maybe our fans can have an idea. Come they can come ideas, up with a... Uh, yeah. Well, they're scattered all over the world. So. That's quite all right. They'll they'll be good at this. If I they know have they a good will. idea, maybe we should invite someone special, or we should sure. go somewhere. Start with a, a little steak something. tartare. <laughs> 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 move on to a few raw pork chops. <laughs> that's, can we go to a beach that's deserted? We can go and eat it on a beach. Yes. Sex on the beach. We can have a drink of that, too. <laughs> no, no, you, you can stay away from that. All right. Tell us if you have an idea how to celebrate 100. It's not a big deal. It's not that We've been to 100 and 200 and 300 on Twiv, oh, you know. know that, but still. I think we'll just do another podcast. <laughs> anyway, Twip is found at microbeworld.org slash Twip, although we will soon have a new home, which I'll tell you about in a few weeks. And um, it's, um, it's a secret, but we'll tell you about it. It's not really a secret, but it's a new home where we're going to have all our podcasts in one place. <laughs> and now, Dixon, you don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, if you want to subscribe, you can go to iTunes. You can go to microworld.org slash twip. You can subscribe on any podcatcher app, which you have on iOS or Android. Many, many ways to get us. And we're free, and we will always be free because we think knowledge should be free, at least infectious and knowledge. Shared. And you can send us comments and questions and guesses about the latest to twip at twiv.tv and I expect that everyone should get this last case study. They should. Yeah, they really should. Needs they definitely to get should. it. <laughs> twip at twiv.tv. Dixon de Pommier is at verticalfarm.com, trichinella.org, medicalecology.com, urbanag.ws. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. You have fun? I had a great time. Excellent. I'm very happy to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sincere. Daniel's happy to hear I'm it sincere. also. Daniel Griffin is We're in here a jolly at mood today. the Medical Center of Columbia University. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed myself today as well. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on TWIP is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkies. You can hear his work at ronaldjenkies.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.